Ah, it's time to chill out and get ready for a mediocre Q&A live stream. If you're old enough, grab yourself your favorite adult beverage. And if you're not, stick with apple juice. Put your feet up and relax. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. And now let's cue up the intro music. Yo, how are you guys all doing? I hope you guys are doing good. I am still getting over this cold thing that I had. I got it from the plane ride home from the AHR show. I'm pretty sure that's where I got it from. I don't know. There was a lady on the plane ride home that was coughing on me the whole time. And I'm pretty sure that's where it was from. But I guess it could have been from something else, too, because I was at the AHR show with uh, officially they said, I think, 50,000 people attended that show was the press release. They had 50,000 people between the three days that attended that show. And I think if I remember the press release, it said 1,900 vendors. So 1,900 different booths, essentially. I'm, well, maybe not 1,900 booths. I don't know how they categorize that one because some vendors consolidated their booths. Like for instance, Johnson Controls had all kinds of different divisions and Emerson had all kinds of different divisions. So it's possible, who knows? But yeah, I didn't have a fever, so I'm assuming it's not the coronavirus. I don't know. I don't know. Who knows? Whatever. I'm getting over it. It's fine. I ain't going to admit it to any officials because I don't want to get quarantined. So it's been all good. Um, hopefully, yeah, it is, uh, it is starting to get a little bit warmer in SoCal. Um, yeah, you know, we're hitting 75 degrees today, I think, 76 degrees down here in SoCal. So, yeah, it's getting there. We'll have some more cold nights. We're coming into spring, so it'll be interesting. It'll be nice, but... Um, so I want to start this off real quick. Uh, my channel right now, YouTube is playing with the algorithm and there's like this ginormous influx of new viewers. We're like insane numbers. And a lot of them don't have anything to do with the HVAC trade, but it's really cool because there's a lot of, I'm getting a lot of cool comments. So I'm going to start this off by introducing myself. Okay. My name is Chris. Uh, I do a live stream, this live stream right here every Monday evening, 5 PM Pacific time work permitting. I'm an HVACR service technician, and I make YouTube videos to try to share the knowledge, the little bit of knowledge that I have with everybody. I started making these videos for my own service technicians, and uh, after I think I had made two videos and I was a little bit nervous, a little bit anxious, I decided to hit the public button, and I decided to start sharing them, and the channel has just grown. In, you know, it's It's been crazy. It's what a ride it's been. So 
Um, I try to do two videos a week, uh, but in all honesty, I, I haven't even released a video since I got back from AHR. I've been super sick, so it's all good. I do what I can. Um, you know, nobody else tells me what to do on this channel. I kind of do it my own way. Um, I'm probably my own worst enemy when it comes to, uh, you know, m monetizing this channel and all that different stuff because, you know, certain people reach out to me. I, I swear once a week I get one of the additive companies, the leak stops or leak sealers or whatever companies once a, probably once now, nah, probably once every two weeks, one of them emails me asking me to, and I'm not into that stuff. I don't want to market any weird dick creams or anything like that. So, um, but anyways, I just try to make these videos to share the little bit of knowledge. Okay. Uh, there's a chat for those of you that don't know going on a live chat. Um, do me a favor guys. Uh, I throw your questions in caps lock. If I miss your questions, just keep repeating them. Okay. I'll either tell you I'm not going to answer it or I'll answer it. All right. So just keep throwing them in there. If I don't get to your guys' questions tonight, throw me an email, hvacrvideos at gmail.com. There is a movie quote that's going to pop up about a half an hour into the stream. See if you guys can guess what that quote is. It's just for fun. I always put in a movie quote. So I got a couple things I want to cover. And then again, I will uh, try to get to your guys' questions in the chat. Okay. So, um, oh, one more thing I wanted to put on here. So we got a huge influx of new viewers and different things, right? Um, the only comments I will ever delete from the YouTube comments, you can call me the biggest loser in the world. You can bash me. You can do whatever. I always leave those comments in there, okay? The only ones I ever delete are when people try to guess the restaurant names. Wrong or right, I just delete the comments. I don't acknowledge them. I don't answer them, all right? Um, it's not that I'm trying to hide what I'm doing. I'm not doing anything wrong by filming the videos that I'm filming. I'm not taking any extra time, but I got to protect my restaurants. Okay. Um, not that my restaurants are nasty, but what a lot of the public thinks is nasty really isn't that gross. Okay. So please, if you guys are going to be in the comments, don't try to guess the restaurant name because I do read every comment and I'll just delete them. Okay. I'd really appreciate it. You guys can help me out if you please wouldn't do that. Okay. Um, I see a, call, a question right now, Dan, where do you get the wireless gauges? Uh, you know, there's many supply houses. Uh, the, the wireless gauges that I really like are the field piece wireless gauges. Uh, I like the, uh, the job link probes, or you can do the S man manifold that has wireless capabilities. Okay. But I like the job link probes. Um, you can get them from, uh, online manufacturer or online tool stores. You can get them from Amazon. I don't really suggest Amazon. I highly suggest going to a supply house and buying them from a local supply house, trying to support your local supply house as much as possible. But if not, there's some really cool tool websites out there. So you're free to check them out. Um, but yeah, I'm a fan of the field piece ones, but I got no affiliation other than having a good relationship, friendship with them. That's it. So, all right. Um, let me see what I got going on again. Uh, why aren't our HVAC kid? Why aren't there more HVACR service techs from Europe making YouTube videos? There's actually quite a few of them popping up. Um, there's a lot of uh, new YouTubers that are there. You know, a lot of people are starting to see and think <laughs> it's funny. I get a lot. Another one of the questions I get the most is how do I become successful? How do I grow my channel so fast? Guys, I don't have any fancy secret at growing a channel, okay? The only honest advice I can give you is stop trying so hard and just let it happen because that's what I did, honestly. Other than researching um, and how on how to use uh, keywords and tags, I use a, a, a software, an app called TubeBuddy, and it just kind of teaches me how to, taught me how to do tags and different things like that. But other than that, I really don't do anything to grow my channel other than just try to put out decent content. Okay. And I'm not like trying to be like, you know, nothing against anybody. I'm not a fancy editor. I like watching fancy edited videos, but I'm just not big at that. So that's just not my style. I just try to just do my style and try not to like be so concerned about the numbers and all that stuff. And I mean, it's, it's hard to not be concerned about the numbers, but Honestly, I have no advice for this, you know, one magic thing that makes your channel grow. It just doesn't happen. Okay. Anyways, I'm going off on a tangent. I got some things I want to cover. Um, oh, right on. Yo, Dims. I don't know how to pronounce your name, but yeah, I'm glad that the channel has helped you out. Okay. There's lots of other great YouTube dudes out there. Check them out. You just have to know um, how to, you know, figure out if they know what they're talking about or not. Right. Cause there's a lot of new guys coming into the trade. There's a lot of guys in um, trade school and there's some guys out there making bad content too. So, you know, I'm not going to 
throw anybody out there, but you know, there's some people, so you just got to just pay attention to the comments, look at the comments and you can usually tell if someone's getting attacked by the commenters and different things like that. Okay. If it seems kind of odd what they're telling you, then it's probably odd. So, uh, if I didn't do, Oh, that's a really good question. Okay. So if I didn't do HVACR, what else would I do? I'm not kidding with you. Um, I would be a park ranger. I would be a park ranger in the middle of the forest. Um, again, this isn't another life, you know, if I didn't have a family and all that stuff, I would be a park ranger by myself out in the middle of like Yellowstone national park. That'd be my thing. I'm an outdoors person, even though I don't get to do it as much as I like to. Um, I'm a backpacking person. So I've, I've, I know the answer to that question is I would be a park ranger if I didn't do HVAC, if I didn't go that career path. So I wouldn't change anything about my life. I love it. I love my family, love my kids, love all that stuff. But you know, yeah, I would be a park ranger. Um, let me see. Adam Wortman. Thank you very much for that super chat, man. I really appreciate it. That was awesome, bud. Okay. Uh, Adam. Yes, I do own my own service company. I actually run my service company with my father. My father started it in the late eighties and him and I, uh, went in together. Uh, you know, we partnered together eh, 10 something years ago and, uh, he's about ready to retire. I think if I'd let him, he'd retire today, but I really can't handle it by myself. So, uh, my father's taught me everything that I know, whether it be good and bad. Um, you know, even the answers that he didn't give me, he drove me to the answers that I needed. Um, you know, so uh, I give all credit to my father for, you know, my limited success in this career. So, um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and get to uh, Dan Witt. Uh, thank you very much. Or Watt, thank you very much for that super chat, man. That's very awesome. Okay, really appreciate it. All right, I'm going to get to, um, oh, yeah, Big Nate, working student. Yeah, bud. The doll. Yeah, I'm not. G <laughs> you guys go ahead and chat about that in the chat room. But yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. That was an interesting one. And I, I feel the same way there, Big Nate. So just just check out the YouTube channel, dude. That's pretty creepy. All right. So um, I had a question about VRFs and uh, and I, I paraphrase this question. A gentleman sent me, I believe he was from another country. Uh, forgive me. I don't remember what country he was from, but he sent me a picture of a York VRF system and he was asking me for a suggestion on a replacement aftermarket thermostat for a York VRF system. We're not talking a tiny little mini split. We're talking a full on VRF system. Okay. So I'm going to lump this into mini splits too. Okay. Um, for the most part, now, some of the mini split manufacturers are getting a little bit better, but when you're dealing with the VRF system, I don't work on VRF systems for one. Okay. I got to preface this by saying that, but I highly suggest you talk to the manufacturer. I'm going to go out on a limb and say most VRF manufacturers aren't really going to approve aftermarket thermostats because they have their own control algorithms and you're probably going to need to use their proprietary thermostat. Now, I'm sure there's a few of them making changes. When it comes to the mini splits, there is mini split companies out there that are making changes and allowing aftermarket thermostats, okay? Um, but for the most part, you're going to want to lean on the manufacturer to find out the answer to that question. Don't be trying to re-engineer something because there's a lot that can go wrong in a VRF system. And uh, you want to make sure that the manufacturer approves any changes, especially within the control system that you want to make. Okay. So sorry to tell you that, but I don't think that they're going to approve it. But again, lean on the manufacturer, so-called Johnson Controls or York, and uh, ask them what they have to say. Just make sure you have the model and serial number like you sent me in the email. Okay. Um, I'm going to just kind of go back and forth between the chat. Let's see. Uh, does a loss of charge switch work? Well, sure. Yeah. A loss of charge switch will work. I mean, a loss of charge switch is simply there to shut something down, usually control voltage or a compressor contactor, uh, when the refrigerant charge is completely gone. Okay. The whole point of a loss of charge switch is to keep the compressor from running when there's no refrigerant and or uh, yeah, when there's no refrigerant in the system, okay, because um, we need that refrigerant, that suction gas coming back to cool the compressor off. Without that, if you just ran a compressor for a very long time with just outdoor air running through it, you would potentially have an overheat issue. So a loss of charge switch is there to just simply turn it off. Now, low pressure control is very similar to a loss of charge switch. In fact, they kind of work almost the same. Well, they do work the same, but usually a loss of charge switch, like for instance, Carrier uses loss of charge switches on their package units, and they actually put the loss of charge switch on the liquid line. And uh, it's not a low pressure control. It's actually a liquid line pressure control. So yeah, just a fancy name for a pressure control. Um, 
Let me see what I'm missing. Did I see any new cool tools coming out at the Expo, Jeffrey? Um, you know, there's lots of the tools that we already see on the internet. You know, I didn't see any tool that blew my mind. I mean, I walked by the Milwaukee booth and, you know, they got all kinds of new fancy different things. Uh, did I hear that Milwaukee's finally announced their cordless vacuum pump? I think that might have come out. But I've been hearing rumors about that on the internet for a while. If you're really interested in new tools, check out my buddies over at the Tool Pros podcast, uh, Brent, Lid Brent Ridley and Billy Noth. Um, they both do a podcast and they have a YouTube channel too called Tool Pros. So definitely check that out. They're always talking about new tools. But um, yeah, Milwaukee's got some new stuff coming out. DeWalt, of course. I mean, I went by everything, but like honestly, nothing grabbed my eye and said, oh my goodness, you know. Um, I went by the NAVAC booth. NAVAC is certainly making waves in the industry because they're, they're really taking the industry by storm, you know, uh, coming out here and coming out with all these new great vacuum pumps. And then they've got recovery machines and charging machines and all kinds of hand tools and stuff too. Um, I will say that some of the cool stuff that I see coming out is the new software and the new technologies coming out. You know, uh, I can't do it because I get motion sickness since I've gotten older, but they have new, um, virtual reality, like simulation training, which could never replace hands-on training. But, you know, as far as you know, uh, taking a trade school class, community college or private school, whatever it is. And then, you know, taking a test, applying the things that you learned, you know, on a, a, a VR system and then potentially doing lab work. Like that's a cool concept, right? There's all kinds of new stuff coming out as far as that goes. I saw lots of cool software, um, that's coming out, uh, you know, different companies that have, um, uh, company integration. So, you know, uh, proprietary software that your entire company can use where you have communication between the entire company where you can take pictures and notes and put them in files and, um, very similar to like a discord server, but private within the company. And then you could also share within with outside the company too. So, um, stuff like that, uh, field piece made the official announcement that they were coming out with the job link manometer, which they had already announced, but they had it. Um, I think they even, uh, gave one away at the AHR show. At least they didn't give it to the person yet, but the person's going to get it as soon as it's released. Um, but yeah, field piece kind of, you know, showcased their job link manometer. Um, you know, there's, uh, refrigeration technologies. I went by their booth and they had said they were going to do some big announcement and they came out with, uh, coil cleaners, like in this, like really heavy duty bag. You know, so you don't have to carry an entire gallon up anymore. And it's actually more concentrated so you can get more use out of it. There's less water in it. Um, I'm, that's off the top of my head. But there was so much at the AHR show. Like, it was so easy to miss everything. I mean, you know, you had... And I'm still working on some footage, but the audio sucks. So that's what I'm trying to figure out. But um, you had uh, industrial process machines at the AHR show, like conveyor belt systems that I don't even know what they were doing. And then uh, Johnson Control had an entire chiller set up, like a full-on chiller. And then you had, um, you know, all the normal manufacturers. Sporlin had a cool booth, and they were. And I'm, I've got some good video footage from the Sporlin booth because I was working the Sporlin booth. And uh, you know, they've got some cool new products that they announced at the show, which are really cool. Um, they've got, uh, they, they kind of came up and redesigned an expansion valve, especially for R290. It's like a smaller valve, which is really cool. And here's what I really like. And again, I'll talk about it more too, but the, what I really like about that little R290 valve that Sporlin's coming out with, I think it's called their NX valve. If I remember right, anyways, they, uh, they, it's tiny, tiny, tiny little valve, but it does not have stainless steel connections. Okay. If any of you guys have worked on any of the R290 stuff, a lot of the manufacturers or one of the major manufacturers out there is using stainless steel connections. And I hate those. They're such a pain in the butt, copper coated, stainless, whatever. Sporlin actually has copper fittings on the ends of their valve, super tiny little valve, really cool stuff. So, uh, Maurice, thanks for becoming a supporter, man. I really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, there's so much more. I've got some footage. I'm going to release of the Sporlin stuff. Oh, another cool thing that Sporlin came out with too was a, uh, electronic, uh, expansion valve retrofit kit. Okay. So say you have like a walk-in cooler with a beacon system. Um, what they have is they actually have a retrofit kit. It comes with like a little board. And again, I'll release this and show video footage, but it comes with a little board, uh, pressure transducer, temperature sensor, an electronic valve. Actually, it works with all kinds of electronic valves, all their little electronic valves. 
I think the three types that they have. Um, and you can retrofit it on an existing system. So it's not a full controls package. You're not selling them a temperature controller and defrost and all that stuff. It's just an electronic valve and you program it with an app. I thought that was pretty cool too. And it's meant to be mounted in a walk-in cooler. It's water resistant. So just off the top of my head, that's some of the things coming out. Uh, there'll be a lot more as I start thinking more and more about it. So, um, yeah, it was definitely a great expo. Lots of cool stuff. It was overwhelming. And then for me, um, I went as press. Okay. So what that means is, is that I actually got into the show at like seven in the morning. The show didn't start till 10 and I was allowed to walk around and take pictures before anybody was there and all that fancy stuff. But uh, it got me invites to a lot of different booths because people wanted to tell you like press releases and all this different stuff. But then uh, just being there, you know, the first time I've ever been to an expo like that, in all honesty, this was a giant drinking fest. Like every night there was some sort of an after party. And it started for me four days before the expo because I went for the um, for Brian Orr's uh, HVAC school uh, seminar conference um, uh, training symposium, right? So I was there uh, Friday morning at 7 a.m. or something like that at Brian's office in, in Florida. And then Saturday, I was there 7 a.m. Uh, Friday night, there was an after party with the speakers and different things. That was really cool. I don't know if I already mentioned this, but I got to sit down with Brian Orr, Jim Bergman, Dick Wurz, and Andrew Greaves. We all sat at the end of the table, had dinner and drank. That was awesome. But again, every night was a big drinking fest. So uh, honestly, I ha I don't think I've drank since I got back from the HR Expo. I'm just like, ugh, so over it because I don't drink a lot. So just every night there was something, uh, after parties, dinners with field, you know, all this stuff. But anyways, I'm going off on a tangent again. So um, definitely go to the HR Expo if you guys ever get the opportunity. Next year, it's going to be in uh, Chicago. Chicago, right? Chicago next year. So I plan on going to that. And then the year after that, we'll be in Vegas. That's going to be a cool one because that's only like five hours, four hours away from my house. So um, will the new EXV work on a key to therm setup? Uh, Adam, I don't think so because um, it's an EXV controller. So you can use a Sporlin EXV on a key to therm temp, uh, you know, control system. But this is a uh, Sporlin controller. So, it, you know, it's not replacing a temp control. It's just replacing the, the expansion valve. So it's got a superheat controller and then you use one of the Sporlin valves and it's like an aftermarket thing. So there'll be some press releases and different things on that. All right. So again, guys, for those of you that are just coming in here, do me a favor. Uh, any questions, put them in caps lock. I'll definitely try to get to them. Okay. Yeah. Beer can cold expo. There you go. Um, all right. Lots of met lots of cool people too. I got, I got to meet Alexander, uh, from Alexander's refrigeration and AC. I got to meet Gil Cavey. I mean, there's so many different people I got to meet, got to sit down and have dinner with Gil and my buddy HVAC rookie Scott. Um, we sat down and had dinner together. That was really cool. So, all right. Um, let me see what else we got going on here. Um, is the business, is the refrigeration business more consistent than heating and cooling? I wouldn't say it's necessarily more consistent. You know what, Ren? Okay, refrigeration can be super crazy busy, all right? We used to be super crazy busy. We used to get stupid hours and all that stuff. But we let go of a lot of those crazy customers and kind of toned it down. That's how we wanted to run our business. I'm, I'm over the crazy going nuts with overtime stuff, you know, never getting to sleep. I'm over that. Um, when I was younger, I could do it all day long. So for me, refrigeration keeps me steady through the winter. Air conditioning keeps and refrigeration keeps me super busy during the summer. All right. So, but I mean, you know, in all honesty at my company, you know, my guys, they were averaging mm, 32 to 40 hours during the winter. All right. And they'll average probably 40 to 55 hours during the summer. So we don't do like crazy, stupid stuff. Um, it's, you know, it doesn't get nuts for us. All right. Let's see what I'm missing here. Um, all right. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, okay. So great question. Um, someone, I, I'm sorry the the comment just went away. Okay. Brandon price. You asked me if I've ever, or anyone else has ever used blue on, we can't not talk about blue on They're They're like, they've got some serious money behind that company. You know that, uh, I think Leonardo DiCaprio is actually an investor in blue on refrigerants. That's why if you notice, like their, their marketing is on point with the blue on refrigerants. I have never used blue on, um, there's a lot of claims made by them about this crazy efficiency that they get and all this fancy stuff. 
I am not, I don't really do the aftermarket or uh, alternative refrigerants. I'm still an R22 user. I will say one of the cool things that Blue On does have is a cool app that consolidates a lot of installation manuals and stuff like that. But I'm sure that they're selling your information to get that app. So yeah, whatever. Um, but if you have any refrigerant related questions about what refrigerants to use and stuff, I always, always recommend my buddy Ralph from Honeywell. He's usually in here. I don't know if I've seen him tonight. Oh, yeah, he's in here right now. Um, hit up my buddy Ralph. He is a really cool dude and he can help you with any alternative refrigerants. All right. Check them out. Um, just be careful. Remember, I'm not saying that Blue On's a bad company. I know nothing about them, so I can't talk any bad stuff about them. But I will say there's a lot of marketing and money going into that company to push that refrigerant out. Whether that's good or bad, you have to make that decision. But I mean, they're they're pushing that stuff so hard. It's crazy. OK, so just be weary of claims that people put on print advertisement. Right. Um, just be cautious about that stuff. Reach out to my buddy, Ralph. I put his email in there. He'll give you some good information. He'll give you some facts about refrigerants and, and good alternatives for whatever refrigerant you're looking for. Okay. So, but again, I'm not talking bad about anybody. So, all right. Um, let me see what else we got. Uh, how many heat service calls do I get on average heating service calls? I probably gotten, my company has probably gotten five or six this entire winter. We don't get a Southern California. We don't know what cold is here. Okay. So we have an extreme low, probably this winter of maybe 29 degrees, like for a couple hours, one night, but our average winter temperature is like 52 degrees to 62 degrees. Like somewhere in there is our average winter temp. So we don't know what cold is. So, you know, and, and most of the time in the restaurants, that's 99% of my work is restaurant refrigeration and air conditioning. Most of the time in the restaurants, um, in my climate, they don't turn the heaters on because if they turn the heaters on, it's going to make it too hot in the building. All you typically have to do is turn off the cooling. And if the restaurant's got enough people off putting their body heat of what probably average 80 degrees off put of your body heat or whatever, um, you'll heat up that building really fast if you have a packed dining room. So most of the time I instruct my customers, don't turn on the heater, just turn off the cooling, give it 10 minutes and you'll be asking for the cooling again. So, um, let me see. Okay, um, I'm reading a comment right now. Dave Wood, you said you went into Howard Industries and they were upset because you stepped foot in there. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I personally don't go to Howard Industries. I don't have anything bad to say about them. Can't say anything bad about them. But my main supply houses are RSD, Refrigeration Supplies Distributors, Allied Refrigeration, and then occasionally I'll go into United Refrigeration. Um, but those are my main suppliers. And unless I need to go to an OEM like Lennox or carrier carrier, Sigler, um, train, that kind of stuff. So, all right, let's see what else. Um, all right. Have I ever had a capacitor that is a direct match from one that came out explode on? No, I, if I understood, if I read that correctly, Jason, I've never had a brand new one explode on me. No, uh, no. Sounds like there's something miswired there. Something's going on. Um, Molly Penderson, R134A is not the refrigerant to go to. Uh, R134A is being phased out just like all the other refrigerants. So, um, all right. Have I ever? Oh, no, I already read that question. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get to some more questions on here. Um, oh, guys, this is another question I've been getting tons and tons of questions about. All right, especially since the AHR show, because if anybody follows anybody on social media, they've been seeing my shirts popping up because of the AHR show. So I didn't tell anybody that I was going to do this. Last year, I had ordered a crap ton of shirts because I thought I was going to sell them, right? Long story short, it's not worth it. It's not uh, economical for me to try to sell shirts because of the government and sales tax and all that crap. And I'd have to pay sales tax to every single city that someone buys a shirt in. It's, it's a nut. It's crazy, right? So I ended up giving away a bunch of shirts on a live stream uh, last year sometime. And then I saved a bunch of those shirts and I took them to the AHR show. I probably handed out a good 40 shirts or something like that at the AHR show. I didn't tell anybody I was going to do it. I just did it when people were coming up to me. Um, I do not have any more shirts. I, I do not plan on selling my shirts. Um, I may get some made. I have one other idea, but unfortunately it's just so difficult to try to come out with hats and shirts because when you start dealing with shipping and everything, it's just a nightmare logistically. And then sales tax is a whole nother nightmare. Business licenses and all these different places. It's just stupid crazy. I've tried, I've looked down every avenue selling on 
Amazon, applying with Teespring. All Teespring, their shirts suck, by the way. That's the company that YouTube integrates into there. I, I spent so much money getting samples made from Teespring and they suck. So anyways, long story short, I really don't plan on selling shirts. I do have one idea and I may entertain this thought. I may, for, for certain supporters, I may come up with a tier level, right? For YouTube and Patreon supporters. And I may include a shirt as a perk of a certain supporter maybe as something I was thinking about, but I got to talk to my tax guy to make sure I'm not going to implicate myself in any which way, because I don't want to get in trouble for this. I don't want to make it seem like I'm trying to avoid sales tax or anything like that. So, um, but anyway, so at this time I do not have any plans on selling shirts or hats or anything like that. I know people see me with my, my signature HVACR hat or my shirts that I'm wearing right now. Um, just I'm all out of them for now. So for those that got one good, you know, good for you, but sorry for those that didn't. So, um, all right, let me see. Yeah, definitely check out. Uh, yeah, anyway, so there we go. All right. Um, yeah, it really does help the stream if you guys hit the thumbs up button. That really is beneficial to me. Okay, so uh, another question that I had was CPR valves, crankcase pressure regulating valves. How do we set them up and what are they for? Um, someone was watching one of my videos. They saw that I had installed a CPR valve on a walk-in freezer and they were curious what it was for and how you set them up. So the purpose of a CPR valve is exactly in its name, a crankcase pressure regulating valve, okay? The crankcase is on the low side of the system, and what it does is it regulates the pressure coming back into the crankcase of the compressor. What can happen on a walk-in freezer, we're just using a walk-in freezer as an example, it's not the only time you would use one of these, but on a, on a system that has a heavy load or a hot pull-down, your compressor can get overloaded with the amount of suction gas coming back to it, and it can go off on thermal overload. Um, it can run high current. It can have all kinds of problems, okay? So what we will do is we have a crankcase pressure regulating valve. There's a couple different methods. We can also do a pressure limiting MOP charge on the expansion valve. I'm more of a crankcase pressure regulator because it's mechanical and you can adjust it. But a crankcase pressure regulating valve, let's just take a walk-in freezer, for example, is there to limit the refrigerant pressure coming back to the compressor. This is the simplest explanation on a hot pull down. So therefore you do not run high amps on the compressor and potentially go off on thermal overload. Okay. Or overload the compressor. So on a walk-in freezer that someone just turned on or on a walk-in freezer that got really warm when it was in defrost, when it turns back on, it can get a high rush of refrigerant coming back to the compressor and it can overload the compressor. Okay. We're not talking liquid refrigerant. We're talking suction gas, but it can still overload it. So a crankcase pressure regulator is installed. It's a pressure regulating valve on the suction line coming to the compressor. And what we do is on a hot pull down on startup of that compressor, we crank the crankcase pressure regulator down and there's an adjustment stem until the compressor hits the RLA, okay? And then we leave it there, all right? So you only do that on a hot pull down and once you set it, it won't change again and you don't really need to mess with it. Now, that is the simplest explanation of a crankcase pressure regulator. There's many other methods. What I'm going to suggest is that you guys check out Sporland's website. On Sporland's website, uh, hang on just one second. On Sporland's website, uh, sporland.com, okay? Um, I'm going to uh, pull it up right now. Let me pull up a screen share, and I'll show you guys how easy it is to find this information. So... Let's go ahead and turn this off. I'm going to transition this over. All right, so uh, if you input sporlin.com on the internet, it'll redirect you to this website right here, which is parker.com, but it's it's still sporlin.com. If you go to support, all right, and if you go down here, uh, hang on just one second. Step back here real quick. There we go. Hold on. Uh, literature. That's actually, we're going to go scroll down, go to literature. And then all you're going to do is scroll down right here. These are all the Sporland tech documents. We're going to scroll down to pressure regulating valves. All right. And you're going to find crankcase pressure regulating for compressor overload protection bulletin 90 10. You pull this up. It's going to explain crankcase pressure regulating valves. And uh, just Russ, thank you very much for that super chat, man. I'm going to get to that real quick. Okay. Um, get to that question. So yeah, this will explain how to set crankcase pressure regulating valves, what their purpose is a lot better than my explanation. Okay. Sporland's website is a great resource. Lots of information. If you're curious about any of their expansion valves, uh, filter dryers, everything guys, uh, their SDS sheets, 
everything on here. There's even Zoom lock information on here. So check out Spoilin's website for sure, okay? Let me turn off this screen share, turn on this, go on back over. All right, um, so definitely check out Spoilin.com. That'll give you some more information out there. Uh, Just Russ, you asked me, have I heard of a Knox spring? Buddy of mine says a service tech sold him it was bad and needs to replace in his furnace. A Knox spring. Well, I think what they might be... I, I've never heard of that, but I can kind of guess that maybe a Knox spring might have something to do with... Because um, we have low Knox furnaces. You know, no, I, I don't know what it is. It might be some like... Yeah, I don't even know. So I do know that we have low Knox furnaces here in California. I've never heard of a Knox spring though. So yeah, I honestly have no idea what that is, but I'm not even going to try to guess. So, um, all right, let me see what I missed guys. If I missed your guys' questions, please throw them down in the chat again. I'm going to pay attention to the chat for a few minutes and see if I can't get through some of these questions. How can I get work from big restaurant chains? Uh, 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 Javier asked that question. Okay, getting in with big restaurant chains can be very difficult. First off, you have to be available. They're not going to let you just usually take one or two restaurants. They're going to want you to take 30 restaurants because they don't want to have 50 billion different companies out there, right? They want to consolidate and have the least amount of service companies as possible. So you have to be ready to take on a pretty heavy load when you deal with the restaurant stuff. Uh, The next thing is, uh, you know, I really don't have any secret advice. We've been in with some of the restaurants we've been in for close to almost 25 years just by being honest and being fair. Today, if someone asks me how to get involved with the restaurants, the easiest way I think would be to get involved as a warranty provider. So become an authorized service company for uh, one of the warranty providers, okay? Uh, Delfield, True, whatever. Become an authorized service agent for them and you're gonna get service calls to a lot of the big chains and then you can hand out your cards then. But understand something too, that when you're dealing with chain restaurants, For the most part, the manager on site will never be able to choose who they want to bring into the restaurant. It's usually a corporate decision. So that can be kind of difficult. Um, But if you just want to get your foot in the door and be able to talk to someone, you know, become a warranty agent for one of the the refrigeration companies out there, the manufacturers, and that might get you in the door. Where that'll get you with that, I don't know. But that's my best best advice I have there. Um, Let's see. Let me see what I'm missing. What are the best and worst brands of commercial HVAC, the everything channel? You know what? I'm not going to say that there's one brand that's worse than the other, okay? It really depends on your comfort with working on a particular brand, right? Because everybody's going to say a Chevy is the worst truck or a Ford is the worst truck or a Dodge is the worst truck, right? But a Dodge technician knows how to work on a Dodge and a Chevy technician knows how to work on a Chevy and so forth, right? Same thing with air conditioning systems, right? There's certainly things that I can say that frustrate me about um, you know, whatever, a York air conditioner or a Linux air conditioner or a carrier or a train, right? There's certain things about every one. Which one am I the most comfortable working on? Linux, because of the ease of their commercial package units and carrier. Those are the most common ones that I work on. Uh, I work on train probably as the third most common and then York is probably the fourth. So I obviously am going to have the most trouble working on a York unit because it just seems like, oh my gosh, this seems so difficult. But, you know, when I go to a Linux unit, it's almost effortless because... I'm so used to working on them. Not saying one is worse than the other, right? It just depends. They all have bad traits, right? Lennox, York, um, they're all using microchannel coils. Carrier just went to this weird ECM driven blower axial fan thing. I mean, everybody has something that looks like a problem. The VFDs keep going bad in a Linux unit. Uh, the York microchannels are horrible to clean. I mean, there's so much. So, I don't think there's one that's worse than the other. It just really depends on you and or your mechanics um, comfort at working on one particular piece of equipment. So if you have a mechanic or if you're comfortable working on one type, then, then, you know, that's the one that I usually try to put in. So, you know, if I choose to replace an air conditioning system, which I'm thinking about doing at my house, I'm going to consider, you know, probably a carrier product, um, I'd, I've never worked on the Linux, um, residential lines, so I don't know if I'm going to go that route. So, you know, it just depends. Uh, Morgan, thank you very much for becoming a supporter, man. I really appreciate that. Can I make a video on how ventilation systems work? Adam Joseph. Well, I certainly have a lot of videos about ventilation systems already, all right? My videos typically aren't, I'm not going to go out there and just like specifically make a video on a ventilation system. Mine are service call videos, but I certainly, if you just look up exhaust fans in the search bar on my channel, you're going to find all kinds of 
videos where I show exhaust systems. And usually in those videos, I give a really good explanation on how air balance works and how important it is. I've also got some live streams where I've done that too. Um, feel free to send me an email to ask me some more questions about ventilation systems to HVACRvideos at gmail.com. Anybody that has any more questions, feel free to send me an email, okay? Uh, the Everything Channel, thanks so much for that super chat, man. I really appreciate that. That's awesome. All right. Let's see. Why do they use micro channels? Are they used to keep the space down? Yeah, micro channels are used for efficiency reasons uh, to reduce refrigerant charge because you need a lot less refrigerant in a micro channel um, to uh, kind of make cleaning easier and to reduce the weight of the equipment. So as a manufacturer, they have a lot of government regulations on them pushing them to make different changes. They got to meet efficiency standards. They want to try to make their units as light as possible because all the manufacturers make equivalent units and one wants to sell theirs more than the other. So they all try to throw in some secret little thing. Um, let's see what else. Javier, thank you very much for that super chat, man. What symptoms would lead me to believe an outdoor TXV on a heat pump was failing? Uh, that's a good question, bud. I really don't work on a lot of heat pump systems. Um, so... As far as symptoms of a failed TXV, well, obviously for it not responding, uh, not either letting the right amount of refrigerant through or the expansion valve getting stuck. But I mean, as far as telling you the symptoms, you probably want to send me an email and we can talk about it a little bit more when I don't got to, um, when I can think about it a little bit more. So HVACRvideos at gmail.com and I can definitely try to answer that. But thank you very much for that super chat, okay? Um, water cooler, oh, okay. Do I have a video on electrical side of refrigeration units? Molly, uh, I do have a video. Basically, one of my more popular videos is called Walk-In Freezer Electric Defrost Explained. And that one really goes into depth about talking about the electric defrost. Um, you guys, most of the videos that I make, you got to remember, well, if you guys don't know this, my videos are actually meant for my own service technicians, right? And if it was something that I had a hard time figuring out or something that I noticed that my techs are struggling with, then I'll make sure that when I get an opportunity, I make a video about that. Um, and I like to try to make videos about things that used to confuse me. Electric defrost on walk-in freezers used to be so confusing for me. Motor starters on exhaust fans, duct detectors on smoke detectors, I mean on AC units. So, and those are the ones that I've really gone into depth on those videos. So, Jeffrey Manuk, thank you very much for that super chat, man. I really appreciate it, dude. That's awesome. Uh, have I ever tested the pressure difference in a restaurant versus outdoors with a Magna Helic? No, I haven't, Adam. I've never used a Magna Helic. I've just used a manometer to test pressure difference, basically, in a restaurant. And I did that recently on a, uh, a video titled the doors are too hard to open or something like that, where I used a, uh, a manometer and I showed the negative air pressure in a building to, and the customer, I think it was that people were turning away because they couldn't open the front doors. Um, but no, I've never used a Magna Helic. So, um, what I missed guys, throw it in the chat again. Okay. Uh, do I have a special way to align pulleys and belts? D hard. Yeah. So, um, aligning pulleys and belts. First off, I'm going to start by eyeballing it if you can. Okay. And then what you can do is take a straight edge, um, I, there's ways that you can put the belt in there and you can look at how the belt's riding in the pulleys and you can line up the pulleys. Um, and then I'm going to use a tension gauge to, well, you should use a tension gauge. I don't, but you should use a tension gauge to tension up the belt. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to kind of eyeball it at first. Then I might throw a straight edge on there. Um, I've seen people do like strings and different things like that, but the only method that I have is a straight edge, but you got to be careful about a straight edge too, because sometimes, um, the pulleys or the sheaves, they might have different thickness, um, and so they might not, if you use a straight edge on the outside of the pulley, it might not be straight. So you still got to eyeball it, get it lined up as best as possible. They also have laser alignment systems and different things like that, but I'm not using that stuff in the small little restaurants I'm working in. So, uh, how do unloader valves work? Well, unloader valves essentially are just going to block off, um, uh, the parts of the compressor basically. So that way you're not, um, you know, and I'm going to be careful about it cause I, I, I understand it in my head, but I'm not going to go any further with that one before I give you false information. So send me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com. I caught myself there before I opened my mouth and said something I wasn't sure about. Um, how do I determine a pulley going bad? Mm, gosh darn it. Hold on just a sec. Let me see if I have my pulley gauge right here.
Nope, I don't have my pulley gauge, but um, I believe in the show notes of this video, there's going to be a browning pulley gauge, and it essentially goes, uh, gosh darn it, I wish I had it right here. It goes into the pulley, and it tells you if the walls of the pulley are starting to get worn out. So if you look at a pulley or an adjustable motor sheave, the walls are supposed to be straight, and if there's any arching going on in there or curves, then what can happen is, is the belt won't ride correctly, and it'll slow down the airflow of that pulley or that sheave or the belts can even get stuck in there. There's a lot that you can be told about a belt that's broken. If you walk up to a system and you have a perfectly good looking belt and it's just snapped in one spot, there's something really wrong there because belts don't just snap. If you notice that it's got a bunch of cracks and it's just a worn out belt, you can also notice that, you, and this is another way to check a pulley too, is look at the belt wear. You can see that one side of the belt is more worn than the other. Something's going on there, whether it be an alignment issue or something but they do have a pulley gauge. So if you look up a browning pulley gauge, and I, like I said, I believe there's a show note, uh, a link to that in the show notes of this video. And uh, it's a really cool little gauge that, that you can adjust the or check the, the pulley basically with it. Um, let me see what else we got going on here. Um, see what I'm missing. I'm going to go back to my list right here. Okay. So I had a question about recovery tanks. Um, forgive me, I don't have your name written down, but someone asked me about in the very beginning before the stream started, if you can use the same recovery tank for R134, for R22, for R410, so long as there's not mixing of gases. So he understood that you, you never mix gases in a recovery tank, right? So you only put one type of gas, but he's asking if he goes and gets it pumped out, can he reuse that tank? Okay. First off, you need to understand something. Um, it depends on who's pumping out your tank, right? So if you're just taking it to the shop and throwing it into another tank, what you want to be careful about is mixing of the oils that are in certain refrigerants and or dirty refrigerants. I typically will send my tanks out or I take them to a supply house. I swap them. They give me a clean tank and then they send it out to be cleaned, tested, and bring it back to me, right? And then I just swap it out the next time I'm there. So yes, you can use the same tank for different refrigerants, but you need to make sure that it's properly cleaned before you put other refrigerants. Because not only do we have concerns about oils getting mixed in there or other contaminants, let's say you have an R22 system that has a really bad burnout and there's lots of acid in the system. Well, that refrigerant tank is going to get really nasty inside. And in fact, what I have right here is a dip tube out of a refrigerant tank. This is out of a 30 pound cylinder. And if you guys look at that, I know it doesn't come up really well, but you notice that at the top, it's a lot more clear right here. But as it gets down further, it gets really dirty. And you notice that it almost looks like it's kind of black. And it is. This has been sucking up dirty, nasty refrigerant out of that recovery tank. This came out of a brand new tank that I got from the supply house. So it just goes to show you that even though the supply house had it cleaned out, there's still contamination in there. Now, this is kind of in every recovery tank out there. You're not really going to get away from this. This is a problem. But I'm just trying to point out the fact that there is contaminants in the refrigerant and in the oil. So if you know you have an extra dirty tank, uh, you definitely want to get that cleaned out properly, right? Don't just pump the refrigerant into another cylinder and try to use it again. The next thing you want to make sure is that if you're using that recovery cylinder, that before you put any refrigerant in it, whether or not you're going to reuse it or not, that you have it pulled down to a proper uh, vacuum and that it's pulled down. Thank you very much for that super chat, okay? Um, I'll answer that question here in just a second. Uh, so yes, you can use the same tank. Another thing to remember too is that there's all kinds of different requirements about reusing refrigerant. Now, I know this wasn't part of the question, but I'm going to kind of go into this topic a little bit too, is that you cannot take refrigerant from one restaurant to another restaurant. you got to look at the proper EPA laws. And in all honesty, I don't even remember them because I took that test so many years ago. Just basically don't try to reuse refrigerant from restaurant to restaurant or anything like that. It's it's not correct. You're not supposed to do it that way. Okay. All right. So I have a super chat uh, with a question here. Uh, the Bucks fan, you said, would I feel okay hiring a restaurant GM that has took the test and became a universal technician? Would I be concerned it affects my business? No. I mean, so long as the person meets the criteria of of uh, knowledge and experience and willingness to get dirty and go into the restaurants, I have absolutely no problem hiring a restaurant GM. Nothing at all. You know, I mean, um, yeah, I don't, I don't see any problems with that at all. I mean, there, there's lots of other factors that go into hiring people, you know, but no, I don't see an issue with that. All right, let's see what else I got going on in here. 
Uh, you invert empty tank overnight and blow out vapor port from liquid side occasionally. Andy Veraconde. I don't quite understand what you're saying there. You invert empty tank overnight and blow out. Are you saying after you've removed all the refrigerant, you're trying to clean it out? I, I don't understand what you're saying there, Andy. Send me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com. We can talk about it a little bit more. Um, guys, there's a lot of questions going by here. So um, is it the volts or the amps that cause problems for electric defrost? Cause problems? I, I don't know that either volts or amps. I mean, you know, if you have the higher amps you have, the more potential you have for high heat um, as far as contacts and different things like that go, Molly. Uh, I don't know what you're asking me there. I mean, there's not one that causes more problems than the other. I mean, the voltage is usually pretty consistent and the amps are usually pretty consistent unless you have some sort of a bad connection and then your amps are going to go up and it's going to get hot if that's what you're asking me. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Um, all right. What is the weirdest request from a restaurant owner that was asked of me on an HVAC unit? What is the weirdest request? Uh, oh, I can't legally talk about that request. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I don't know. I, I don't know that I've ever really come up with something that's been weird. I mean, I've had all kinds of weird people, you know, restaurants saying, Hey, can you take a used compressor and put it in this? If I order a compressor, can you put it in like that kind of stuff? But I say no to that. That's not my style of work. So there's a, no no offense to people that do that. That's just not my uh, not my cup of tea. So, um, hey there, Ted. How you doing, bud? Anti DIY HVAC. Ted has a great YouTube channel. Go check it out, guys. Um, let's see what else I got. Um, all right. To get the residual oil out, that dip tube can't reach when. Oh yeah, definitely, Andy. Yeah. Okay. So I get what you're saying. Yeah, cleaning it out that way. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's true. You know, um, supposedly, I don't know if it's true because I see those things pretty nasty. But supposedly, um, uh, they acid wash them before they give them back to us. But I don't. You know, I don't know. They're still pretty nasty inside. Um, Scott S. Do I ever try to show financial gain for full equipment replacement, and what tools do I use? No. And I think I know what you're asking me, like show the customer the total cost of that kind of stuff to, to try to convince them to replace equipment. I think that's where you're going with that question. Um, and that actually leads into a question I have on my stuff right here too. And I get this question all the time. Why are you fixing this equipment and why not just replace it? All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to tackle this question and I saw a super chat come through. I'll get to that here in just a second. So, um, but before I forget, let me say thank you, Kyle Wallace. Um, I'll, I'll definitely get to that if I uh, held on just a second. Okay. So about the, um, why I don't replace equipment. Okay. It's all the customer's decision to replace whatever equipment they want. I provide the customer with a quote to repair it. Sometimes I'll provide the customer with a quote to replace it, depending on what restaurant I'm working for. A lot of my national, my big restaurant chains, they buy their own equipment, right? So I have no choice over the matter. I just give them a quote to repair it and they say, no, nah, we're going to replace it and they'll ship me out a unit or whatever. But for the most part, in the state of California, it is so ridiculously hard for a customer to properly and legally replace equipment that most of them either don't replace it or don't do it legally, okay? Um, so most customers are left fixing their equipment because of all the red tape they have to go through to try to replace it. So someone had asked me a question in my chat or in my uh, one of the comments, and they were like, you know, with the efficiency and the rebates and all this different stuff, why wouldn't the customer just replace it? Well, with all the red tape you have to go through in the state of California. So let's just say, for instance, I'm going to give you in a nutshell. We have a restaurant and they want to change a package unit. Well, the package unit on that restaurant is um, 30 years old, 25 years old, right? So the new package unit weighs about 300 pounds more. And you're going to need a curb adapter that weighs another 300 pounds. Well, first off, right off the bat, the restaurant or the, the city wants to see um, a structural engineer approve that extra weight on the roof, even though, you know, 600 pounds is probably not that much. Well, they want a structural engineer involved to make sure that the building can handle the load. Then when you put the curb adapter, the city wants to make sure that it looks pretty from the outside of the building. OK, all these things I understand. So then they're going to have you do a, a site elevation drawing, basically have an architect draw the building. Right. They don't want a picture drawn by hand and they don't want a picture taken with a camera. They want a site elevation drawn and they want to show from 30 feet away, from 40 feet away, from 50 feet away, how much of that air conditioning unit can be seen from above the parapet wall of the roof. Then they want you to 
um, have your ductwork tested to make sure that once you install the new unit, that the ductwork is performing to the best of its ability. So that involves a third party contractor to come in and make sure that after the unit's been installed, that the ductwork is delivering everything. And if it isn't delivering everything, they won't sign off on the permits. Even if the customer is fine with some leaking ductwork, the city won't let them finish the job until they replace all the ductwork. So then you have an added expense there. Then on top of that, uh, you know, the city wants all kinds of, you know, they want the building brought up to code, basically, depending on the municipality you're working in, they might start when an inspector gets into that building, they, it might open Pandora's box. Um, you know, just it just leads into a nightmare. So the customer basically is given the option. And most of the time, they just want to repair the unit. And so they'll put all kinds of crazy money into it. So um, it's a very hard sell to sell new equipment in the state of California. So legally. All right. Um, so the super chat, Kyle Wallace asked me if I could quickly address the EEV and the EEV motor Q. Um, I don't understand your question, Kyle. Uh, send me an email. I'm not super smart with the EEVs. I work on them a little bit, but I don't know a whole bunch about the motors in them. Send me an email to HVACRvideos at gmail.com and I'll try to get to that. Okay. Um, have I seen many incidents where an internet connected thermostat has locked up after a manufacturer pushed out a firmware update, i.e. the train one? No, I haven't seen that instance, but I am afraid of that. I actually just pulled out a Siemens um, automation system on a small restaurant that had three package units in it and it controlled the lights too. And uh, was actually this morning, I started super early at four this morning and went and pulled out an entire Siemens system and put in for the customer. Customer provided internet thermostats. They went with a BayWeb system not a huge fan of it had an electrician there we wired in all the lighting or he did all the lighting contactors and different things and then we hooked it up to the internet and now the customer has an internet dashboard and all that fancy stuff i'm not a fan of that i mean i see the the potential savings and different things like that one of the reasons why i don't like the bay web thermostats in all honesty is because their user dashboard is just like a cluster f it's very confusing it's not very user friendly, so I'm not a fan of the Bay Web ones, but I, I shouldn't talk crap about them. I mean, their their components kind of work okay. So, seems like I missed a lot of stuff in there. If I missed it, throw it down in the bottom. Okay, yeah, California definitely has too many regulations for sure. Um, all right, with my knowledge in HVAC, you don't understand how I'm not a millionaire. Love my channel and keep it up, Pat V. Thank you very much, Pat. I am nothing special. There's many other guys down in the chat right now that are much smarter and much more you know, amazing when it comes to HVAC work. I am just a normal service technician that has learned from a lot of my mistakes and screwed up a lot of stuff. Most of the things that I warn people about in my videos, if I say, don't do this, I, I said this in the Brian and at the HVAC school symposium thing in my talk was I specifically said, cause I've mentioned this many times when I say, don't push in contactors on units. The reason why I say that is because we've made that mistake. When I say don't push in a bypass contactor for a VFD on a Linux package unit, yeah. I actually didn't make that mistake, but one of my guys made that mistake. And the VFD blew up and shot across the roof. So it's mistakes that I, myself, or my company has made, and I try to share that information with everybody else, okay? that's I'm nothing special, so. Um, how about flare dryers and sight glasses? That's my, I'm, I'm a man. I, I love the flare dryers and sight glasses. Those are awesome. Um, guys, the reason why I use flare dryers as much as possible on the roof with a flare sight glass, a male, female flare sight glass is because I'm lazy. That's plain and simple. Why I like to use flare dryers and flare sight glasses. I don't want to have to drag my torches on the roof. Most of the time we're fixing leaks on reach-ins and walk-ins and different things. And most of the time the leak is downstairs at the evaporator. All I got to take up is my vacuum pump. Now I don't got to drag my torches up. It's because I'm lazy that I use a flare dryer and a sight glass less brazing. Just go up there and flare in the dryer and be done with it. So, um, you know, I, I, and uh, by heart, I'm a lazy person. So, um, thank you very much again for that super chat, Pat V. That was awesome. All right. Let's see what else. Um, let me see what I'm missing here. Um, did I ride the short bus? No. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, I, I rode a short bus with you, Steve, to the Brian or HVAC school symposium. That's right. We did. Uh, we rode a short van. It wasn't a short bus, but um, any advice for opening up my own or your own company, Mark? Um, yeah, advice for opening up your own company. First off, don't open a business if you have no idea how business works, right? I, this is my advice. Take it as it is. You do not have to listen to me. I am not a finan uh, business person. My buddy Tersh Blissett over at the service or at 
um, Service Business Mastery Podcast has a great, um, great advice. And basically, so go check out Tersh's podcast and his YouTube channel, Service Business Mastery, okay? Um, but my personal advice for a business is, is don't open up a business in debt. Uh, try as hard as possible to do a debt-free business. Um, try not to take on a bunch of capital and financing and all that stuff to bring your business up. I understand some people do that. Okay, that's just not my style. Again, I'm just saying my style. Run your business on a cash-based business as po- much as possible. Um, be educated on how to run a business properly. Understand all the business terms and um, what your overhead is and what your load, r- loaded labor rates are and different things like that. That's going to help you a lot because that'll help you determine what your pricing should be, how much you should charge an hour, uh, what you should pay your technicians. You need to look at all of that, right? And then on top of that, you have to be an amazing service technician already. Um, No offense to anybody that's doing this, but starting a business out of trade school, you're crazy, right? You're actually hurting yourself and you're hurting all your competitors too. Just because you're the cheapest person in town doesn't mean you're going to be successful because eventually being the cheapest person in town is going to catch up with you. It's either going to give you a heart attack or you're finally going to realize that you're not making enough money and you lost out on hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars over the course of your business because you are cheaper than everybody else, right? So you need to sell yourself and you need to charge what you're worth. You need to charge a premium for your services and you need to make a profit while taking care of the customer. So I went off on a tangent. Hopefully that answered your question. Um, any other questions? If I didn't answer that enough, give me an email. Molly Penderson, what is an economizer? An economizer can be used on the air side or on the water side. And essentially it's an energy saving device to allow free cooling. So what that means, let's take the simplest of terms, a normal package unit on the roof. If it is 40 degrees outside, and we have a call for cooling in the building, we are going to turn on compressors and we're going to use electricity to run those compressors. Well, if the air outside is suitable, meaning that the temperature is not too low, the humidity is not too high or too low, then what we can do is we can open up a damper, potentially turn off the compressor and bring free cooling into the building. Okay. You can also use economizers on water source heat pumps on water side, on chilled water systems, all kinds of things. But the concept of an economizer is that it's an energy saving device to potentially save you money. Potentially, because most of the time, in my opinion, and most of the other commercial service tech's opinions, economizers don't save a lot of money in the long run. But, you know, whatever it is. All right. Um, did I, did anybody see the, um, I, the, the movie quote? Did that pop up in there yet? I don't know if anybody got that yet. Anyways, um, let me see what else. Oh, yeah, there it is popping up. All right. Uh, see what I'm missing in here. Um, all right, I'm going to get back to my list right here. Uh, what happens if you can't fix a problem? So someone asked me that, and, I, and actually I didn't get an answer to his question because I didn't understand it. But there's often times that we'll go out on service calls and we don't know how to fix it, right? Uh, of course, I always do right by the customer when it comes to my labor rates and different things like that if there's something I can't figure out. But I will try and try and try. I will get the equipment usually running if it's something. It's been a long time. I mean, I can remember many times when I was younger where I came up with every reason in the world to have to come back to that job site without telling the customer I didn't know what the hell I was doing and that I needed to come back on another day. And then I would go home and do a bunch of research and then come back the next day and figure it out. So if your customer is willing to, to be patient with you, just be honest with your customer as much as possible. You know, just say, hey, you know what? This is a new system. It's really peculiar. I need to call and talk to technical support. I got it operational. I'll be back tomorrow. And then obviously be fair with your time and the customer, right? You know, if, if you feel like, hey, you know what? I probably shouldn't charge for some of this time. You got to do that on your own. I'm not saying not to charge for your time, but got to be fair with the customer. So, um, Do I work on chillers and or boilers? No, Anthony, I do not. I work on restaurant refrigeration and air conditioning. No chillers, no boilers. Um, Sorry, bud. There's many other guys in here that do do boilers. So, Uh, all right, let me see what else I got going on here. Uh, The suck dome. Yep. Yep. All right, Hamilton. Uh, Twister is one of my favorite movies. That's what that was from. Uh, Twister, if you guys haven't watched that movie, I think it's from 1994, 1996. Um, horribly acted, 
horribly shot. There's so many mistakes. There's so many scenes in that movie when the red Ford or the red Dodge that he's driving, they, they swap out a different Dodge. Look at the tailgate. Sometimes it'll say Dodge. Sometimes it'll be just a red tailgate. There's so many different times that they change the truck. Sometimes there'll be a cracked windshield from when something hit them in a tornado. And then the next scene, the, the windshield's not cracked anymore. I love that movie though. Twister is one of my favorite movies. Um, yes, it was. All right. Uh, all right. Let me see what I'm missing here. What books do I recommend for commercial air conditioning? Oscar, that's a good question. I don't really have a go-to book for commercial air conditioning. I have a go-to book for commercial refrigeration, and that's called Commercial Refrigeration for Air Conditioning Technicians. I guess I need to come up with a book for commercial air conditioning. I'll do some research um, and see if I can come up with a good book. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll come up with a good one for you. Uh, send me an email, hvacrvideos at gmail.com. All right. Uh, do I use HVAC Talk? Scott S. It has been a while. I recently went on HVAC Talk for the first time in probably six to eight months. Um, I used to use HVAC Talk. That was my go-to resource for finding information out. The cool thing, HVAC Talk, for those of you guys that don't know, is a message board. It was one of the first message boards out there with HVAC help many, many years ago. A uh, great, great book. Um, Hoser, thank you very much for that super chat, man. This is so Ted can buy a new bingo dabber. All right on, dude. <laughs> All right. Um, let me see what I'm missing in here. Um, I'm going to go to my list. Um, answer that question. Answer that question. Okay, so um, how? Okay, so I'm going to talk about this. Someone asked me how they can get involved in HVAC. First off, HVAC, for those of, I know there's a few new people in here that maybe not even in the trade or, you know, just watching this because I've been getting a lot of odd viewers, which is fine. Um, HVAC is a great trade. There's lots of money to be made. You can pretty much live um, a middle class to upper middle class lifestyle as an HVAC service technician across the country. Okay. Um, the pay rate is obviously going to change all over the place, right? But you will still live within your region middle class to upper middle class, if you know your stuff and you bust your butt, you can live a good life as an HVAC service technician, okay? There's all different facets to go into, um, whether it be air conditioning, residential, commercial, refrigeration, process refrigeration. There, I mean, it just keeps going. There's so many different things. You can work in a factory setting where you don't ever leave the factory for the rest of your life. You can run a service truck like I do where I drive around town all the time and I'm at a different restaurant every single day solving different problems. You can start your own business once you get good enough. I mean, you can do so much in the HVAC trade. So it's a great trade. How do you get involved? Go to a local trade school, whether it be a private or a community college, whatever it be, whatever's best for you. Don't overspend. Remember that you need to interview that trade school just as much as they're going to potentially interview you. Don't just settle for the only trade school in your town. It might be worth it to drive, you know, three hours or two hours down the road to a better school, right? Listen, look on the internet, talk in different Facebook groups, ask people what trade schools they went to, what's the success rate. Don't necessarily just listen to whatever trade school and what they tell you their job placement numbers and different things like that. Okay. Because there's many public and private trade schools that say they have great job placement. Well, does that person continue to carry a job after six months? I mean, some trade schools just have deals with companies where they'll just hire everybody and then they, they, you know, lay them off or whatever. So, but another thing to remember is that a trade school is not going to teach you that everything you need to know An HVAC career is going to tell from a long life of learning, basically. So I went to HVAC school. I went to a local community college, Mount Sac, Mount, Sac, Mount San Antonio Community College. They have an amazing refrigeration program um, still to this day. But I went there, but they didn't teach me everything. I also worked with my father. He didn't teach me everything. I also worked with a mentor, my cousin, and he didn't teach me everything. But between the three of those, I got my skills and my education. It took multiple sources of education to learn the little bit that I needed to get rolling and to become, you know, somewhat of a decent service technician, you know, so, um, you're not going to learn it all, but just don't blow your wad. Basically don't go out there and spend $18,000 and assume that you're going to know how to fix everything. Be very careful about spending a large amount of money to go to a trade school because they will not teach you everything. But I do believe that you need a trade school education of some sort, right? There's some people that just want to learn on the job and that's great. But I'm the kind of person that needs multiple sources of education for me to work and to be able to understand things. So 
Uh, HVAC is a great trade. Definitely get involved. For those of you that are on the fence, do it. It's a great trade. There's lots of different areas to work. It's amazing. All right, let's see what else. Um, um, see what I'm missing here. Uh, yeah, everybody's waiting for the debut of my tool channel. That'll come. I promise, guys. I promise, I promise, I promise. Do me a favor, guys. When it comes to my tools channel, when it comes to my this YouTube channel, share my posts. I'd really appreciate that. When I post a video, share it. Any way that you can help my channel grow is going to help me and help me to get the motivation to, to keep doing this. Okay. So I really appreciate it if you guys share whatever videos I have, um, when, you know, if you like something, share it, share it with a friend, whatever. So share it in Facebook groups. I'd really appreciate it. So, um, let me see. Oh, uh, Steve, any, okay. So let's, I'm going to answer Steve's question. So Steve, uh, with HVAC residential basics said a trade schooler started riding with him today and he's asking me for any advice. So I'm going to give advice to that trade schooler. First off is, um, your job, number one, this, this is to a new tech. Okay. Or an apprentice, your job does not stop when you clock out at the end of the day. Your job is actually just getting started when you clock out at the end of the day. So when you are in a service vehicle riding with a mentor, and you are going around fixing things. Number one, you need to learn when to keep your mouth shut, but you also need to learn when is a good time to ask questions. Uh, you need to feel that out because not everybody's the same. You just need to ask them, hey, I have some questions. Is this a good time? And he says, no, not right now. Okay, cool. Ask him at the end of the day. Take lots of pictures and take lots of notes while you're working. Take down models and serial numbers of all the equipment on the roof when you're up on the roof, even if you're not working on it. Go home and research that equipment. Pull down tech manuals. Pull down installation manuals. Look and read on how that equipment works. Pay attention to what your mentor is telling you. Um, listen to what he has to say. He may not tell you all the proper ways to do things because if someone rides with me, they're not necessarily going to learn all the correct ways to do things, but they're going to learn something and I'm going to give them some information that they can go research on their own and maybe become a better person than I because they did some research. Lean on um, Facebook groups, HVAC Talk, the message board, Find a mentor online that you can ask, you know, send an email to and say, hey, I ran into this problem. Okay, but understand something. Um, don't be a punk to the person that you're working with, okay? Even if you think he's doing something wrong. I came up working for an old school technician, my dad. He didn't know how to do everything right, but I learned all the most valuable things that I, that I, I you know, that I have in my head these uh, today, basically from my father, even if I didn't know I wanted to learn that stuff. When I was working with my dad, um, you know, there's many times where he didn't understand how something was working and he would throw parts at it and then eventually he would get it fixed. But you know what I noticed with my father was that when he was writing up the invoice, I would ask him like, Hey, you didn't bill for all those parts that you used. And he said, yeah, because I didn't really know what was going on and I figured it out. I learned while I was working, but I can't find, I can't, I don't think it's right to charge the customer for all that stuff. Right. So I learned lessons just from watching my dad interact with customers. Right. And you know, even the information that my dad didn't have for me, that drove me to find the information that I needed because if he couldn't tell me what superheat was, then I went home and I started researching and then I asked other people and I learned what it was. So just because, you know, the person that you're working with isn't always giving you the right information. You don't need to be rude about it because there's value in any information. And, um, you know, you take what you can from everything. And even if it's, hey, I, I learned not to do this. I learned not to charge the customer for these parts because my boss charged him and I don't think it was fair, you know. Um, but just don't be a punk, right? And as far as being a, a mentor, um, I'm not perfect, right? I, I'm human. I make mistakes, uh, be very humble and be honest. You know, if, if, if your apprentice asks you a question, you don't know the answer, just say, Hey, you know what? I don't know. Let's do some research together. I'll do some and you do some and let's talk about it in the morning. You know, just be willing to admit your faults and uh, let them know like, Hey, you know what? I didn't pull a proper vacuum on this system because we don't have the time. You know, the customer doesn't want us to spend, you know, seven hours waiting for this evacuation to get down to 200 microns and pass the decay test. They just need it running. So while I know that it's right to pull a vacuum the proper way, sometimes there's what's practical too. So just be honest with your apprentice and explain those things to them. So again, off on a tangent. Thank you very much, uh, Doc Mannix, for that super chat. That was really awesome. I really appreciate it. Okay. Um, 
Let me see what we got. Uh, have I found a way to teach mechanical inclination or do I feel you are born with it? That is a really good question, Andy. Mechanical inclination, that is a hard one. See, I i was somewhat of a mechanical person, right? I, I'm Honestly, I can't explain to you exactly how an engine works today. I mean, I understand the three products of combustion. Like, I understand that. But I mean, I can't take apart an engine today and know exactly what's going on in it. But I am a mechanical person. I could take it apart and I could stare at it and I could try to figure things out. When I was a kid, I used to take everything apart. I used to get in trouble for convincing my big sister to let me take apart her roller skates or take apart, you know, whatever. Like I used to love to take things apart. That was my thing. Um, you know, so I'm not the, the, the greatest mechanical mind in the world, but I do somewhat decent in this trade. So I don't think you have to be like a super mechanically inclined person, but I will say that majority of the time, mechanically inclined people do make for better potential service technicians um, because they're easier to teach uh, certain things. So, you know, I don't know if I answered your question. I kind of went a little bit. Um, how big is a walk-in cooler area-wise? It really depends on the, the height, the width, and the depth. Um, you know, you can have industrial walk-ins that you can drive semi trucks, multiple semi trucks, warehouse coolers and freezers. You can have a walk-in cooler that's, um, four foot by four foot by six foot. I mean, it, it just depends. You can refrigerate just about anything. So, um, let me see. Have I, f oh yeah, so I answered that question. Okay. Um, as a farm kid, you struggle with people who don't have it. Yeah. It's a hard thing. I mean, it's, it's hard. You know, one of the biggest things as a mentor, um, as a service manager, as a business owner is hiring service technicians and keeping service technicians. That is a very difficult process. Um, I, I, I'm not going to say I'm successful in it because I'm not. I, I've certainly made so many mistakes in the past. I've lost some of the best technicians ever because we were stupid and weren't paying attention to pay rates and different things like that. Heck, we even lost three service technicians at one time, and we were a four-man service company, including myself at the time. So I lost every one of my service techs, and it was only me left. That was a big mistake. And one of the service techs just got the most amazing opportunity. Uh, two of the service techs were just burnt out, and we weren't paying them enough. We, we made some huge mistakes. We learned from them. Um, but we're not perfect. So do I, I don't have any answers. I, I, I screw up stuff just the same as you guys do every single day. So, um, let me see what I got here. Uh, do I, they have a Portillo's restaurant in California yet? Yeah, we have two Portillo's Ren. We got one in Buena Park and one in Marina Valley. That's there's two so far in California that I know of been going to Portillo's for years. The Maxwell street Polish is my favorite hot dog. And the, uh, the spicy Italian beef is my favorite sandwich from there. Um, they also have really good fries. Uh, let's see what else. Um, Portillo's. Portillo's. I don't know if you guys pronounce it Portillo's, but I pronounce it Portillo's because I'm from California and majority of our people are Hispanic. So, um, Chad, dude, super chat, man. Chad, Chad, that was awesome, man. Thank you very much. Guys, Chad is a local service tech to me. Um, I've only met him once or twice. I think it's only once chad i think but man that was an amazing super chad dude thank you very much chad that's awesome bud holy moly um let's see so did i say portillo's right guys or do you guys say portillo's see i say portillo's um all right let's see what i missed here I really appreciate all you guys with these super chats, man. You guys are flipping amazing. Thank you guys so very much. You guys, I don't do these for that, but I mean, it's awesome when I do get support. So thank you so very much to everybody that has super chatted tonight. That is awesome, guys. I'm, I'm so blown away that you guys are willing to give me your hard-earned money. That's that's flipping awesome, guys. You guys are just, I'm, I'm so blown away by that. I, I don't even know what to say. Thank you very much. Ted, thank you very much, dude. I really, <laughs> Ted, that, thank you, man you're cool. I know, I, I know, I know why you did the 51, but thank you very much, Ted. You're awesome, man. All right. Um, all right, let me see what else we got going on in here. Um, let me see what I'm missing on my list of things to talk about. My voice is getting hoarse for sure. I'm fighting the freaking coronavirus. All right. Can Copeland scroll compressors take liquid refrigerant? Well, no scroll, no compressor in general is supposed to take liquid refrigerant, but um, Copeland scroll compressors 
they can handle a little bit of liquid refrigerant, but I mean, any compressor is not meant to take liquid at all because eventually it's going to destroy the compressor. So the way that the compressor is made, because liquid doesn't compress, something's got to give. And usually it's the scroll plates or on a, a reciprocating compressor, it's the valve reads. Um, so, uh, it, you know, yes and no. I, I wouldn't personally say that one compressor can take liquid better than another. Nah, I, I don't really buy that one. I mean, they do a lot for recips to put in built-in accumulators and the scroll compressors. They do the best of the design them so that way you don't run into those problems. But uh, Matt Gordon, thank you very much for that super chat, man. Any good tips on identifying compressors? Go to what evap on a rack system that is not identified where they go behind running up and down. Yeah, Matt, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, finding... Uh, Identifying compressors on a rack system can be a nightmare sometimes. Um, first off, a thermal imaging camera is a really cool new resource that I have for identifying compressors. Um, uh, amp clamps can be good resources. Uh, you've got the field piece wireless job link probes that are very good resources now. You can wirelessly go downstairs and see things turn on on the roof and see when pressures turn on and off, turning temperature controllers. Um, I start by looking for any faded markings um, you know, uh, and then go from there. Send me an email, Matt, even if, uh, just do me a favor and send me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com and just remind me, and I'll try to come up with a better, um, th uh, some better ideas. Cause I, sometimes it's hard for me to, to verbalize the things that I do when I walk up on a system to help identify what's in there. Send me an email and I'll try to, um, come up with some things and I'll either talk about it on a stream or I'll, I'll send you an email back, Matt. So really appreciate that, bud. Um, the name is Italian, so it's probably pronounced Portillo then, right? Since it's Italian, but I'm, I'm from California. So I say Portillo because we're all Hispanic people here. Um, all right. Uh, again, you guys in these super chats are ridiculously awesome. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you, you guys are just awesome. All right. Um, let me see what we got going on in here. Uh, show the scroll plates. Yeah. Hold on just a second. I'll grab them right now. So it's rather difficult to smash a scroll plate, but basically the scroll plate, one of these is stationary and the other one moves. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's pretty hard to blast a scroll plate apart. In all honesty, you're probably going to damage other components in here. But it, I mean, they do. I've, I've heard of people destroying scroll plates, though. So enough liquid refrigerant would destroy that steel scroll plate. But it's a little bit it's pretty difficult in its design. Um, but yeah, this is a cutaway of a scroll compressor that I did. Um, and then what I did was for those of you that are interested and guys, if you want to know how compressors work, cut one apart, you have plenty of them, drain the oil out of it, cut them apart. And then what I did was I took a uh, simple green and I soaked this in simple green for like a week and then drained it off and dried it off. And then, uh, it got all the grease out of it. Now, that particular scroll compressor that I have over there, what failed on that compressor was the um, the pressure relief valve within the compressor. There's a pressure relief valve when the we call it scroll separation, but it bypasses, and uh, the pressure relief was weak on that because it kept getting... Uh, the condenser was very dirty and the customer wasn't maintaining it and it kept going off on high head pressure to the point that the pressure relief, the internal pressure relief in the compressor kept popping and it got weak. So that's why we had to replace that compressor, so... Um, yeah, I really appreciate a um, thumbs up on the videos, guys, all right? Um, use a wire tracer on the copper, I'm assuming, uh, for finding compressors. That's a good method, too. Yeah, finding out which compressor is what. Um, do reciprocating compressor motors have counterweights? I don't know if they have counterweights. That's a good question. Never, never really paid attention to that. Um, do scroll plates os oscillate or reciprocate? Uh, I believe they oscillate, right? Because they spin. Yeah, so I believe they o oscillate, I think. I don't know. That's a good question. See, I'm not afraid to say I don't know. Um, what do I do with the oil from the compressors? Great question, Jason. Jason. Uh, I honestly have no idea what to do with oil from compressors. I've asked my supply houses because technically you're not supposed to throw it in the trash. I've taken it to AutoZone. I've done all that different stuff, and I don't know what the best way to get rid of the oil from a scroll compressor is. Don't know. Never really come up with a great solution on that one, so I'm not going to tell you what I do with it, but um, yeah. 
Edgar, thank you very much for that super chat, man. I really, really appreciate it. You guys are freaking awesome. Thank you, thank you. All right, guys, throw some more questions in here. I'm going to go through my list and see if I'm missing anything. Um, conversations with my customer. Question I had is, is, how far do you take a con conversation with a customer and how much information do I give the customer? That's going to change for every single customer. If I have a customer that seem, first off, I'm going to give them all a set amount of information. I'm going to be honest with them and fair with them and tell them, look, you've got a bad compressor because whatever, right? Well, we don't know why it's bad yet, but we got to replace it and then we'll diagnose what's bad about it. Um, but I give them all that information. I tell them, hey, the condenser is dirty on this capillary tube system, but from my experience, when you have a plugged up condenser this many times, you tend to have refrigerant problems with the capillary tube. So I'd like to go ahead and open up the system and analyze the refrigerant, see how it's operating, see what the pressures are looking like. I mean, I share that information with them. Now, if they start asking me questions, well, why would a dirty condenser lead to a plugged up capillary tube? Well, then I'm going to go into that with them and I'm going to explain it until I start to see their eyes glaze over. And then once I see their eyes glaze over, then I know, okay, I've given you too much information. But I try not to go in with everything all up front and scare them because then I'm just speaking a foreign language to them. So I start giving them a certain amount of information. And then once I get to a point and I realize like, hey, they're starting to roll back in their head with their eyeballs okay, I'm giving them too much. I need to back off a little bit, but I love to talk personally. I love a customer to come up on the roof with me and, uh, I'm going to talk their ear off. I'm going to, they're not going to get there and stand and just watch me. I'm going to, you know, this is why I'm doing this. This is what's happening. I bring to their attention. Hey, since you're up here, look at this, look at this problem. Joel, thank you very much for that super chat, man. That's awesome. All right. Uh, do I ever draw a picture for my customers to understand or to grab their attention? Yeah. Um, I'm going to hold on. I've got a perfect example. Let me show you guys something here. Oh, right here. Nope. Oh, come on. Well, I can't find it, but I'll even break out a paper bag. I've shown it on my live streams before to explain air balance and take a paper bag when I'm telling the customer, you've got a makeup air unit that's down. Well, why does that matter to me? Well, because now your building's in a negative air pressure. Well, what does that mean? I'll grab a paper bag and suck the air out of a paper bag and watch it collapse. And then I'll cut a hole in the bottom of the bag and show them how the bag doesn't collapse anymore because I'm allowing outside air to go through the bag and be exhausted, right? So I like to visually explain things as much as possible to customers. I ask customers, hey, would you like to come on the roof? I'd like to show you this. Take them up there. Take them by the hand and show them. This is your air conditioner. This is what happens when it's dirty. This is why there's water leaking downstairs. Yeah. And if I have to, yeah, I'll draw pictures, take pictures with my phone, take them downstairs, make a little video, snap a little video and take it downstairs and say, this is what's wrong with your air conditioner. I try to show everything to the customers to try to build that trust. And uh, so then that way they understand and they know that I'm not there just to rip them off. So um, let's see what else. Um, will I buy Portillo's with the super chats tonight? Uh, no, because I've actually been eating a lot healthier lately. No joke, guys. I stopped eating, um, made an effort to start eating healthier just before Thanksgiving. And my, my biggest efforts, I haven't been working out or anything. My biggest efforts have been cutting out sugar. And when I say cutting out sugar, like I don't eat cookies, I don't eat candy anymore. Um, hell, I had a piece of pie at Thanksgiving. I didn't even have a piece of pie at Christmas. Um, I cut most sugar out. Now I'll eat fruit all day long. When I came home today, I ate two oranges. Like I'll eat fruit, but no joke, just from cutting out the sugar and cutting out, uh, like legit, I used to drink a lot of apple juice. I not, not, I'm being serious, like cutting out apple juice and cranberry juice and different things like that. I've dropped 25 pounds just from cutting sugar since November. So, um, I'll still drink beer every once in a while, but I don't drink that much. But um, yeah, all I drink is water, coffee, and iced tea. And these carbonated waters from Costco, they're like my favorite. No flavor, no nothing. Um, it's it, it definitely takes an effort on your part and you have to be, you can't just like try to do it. You have to want to do it. And my wife has been trying to tell me to do that for a long time and I just finally did it in 25 pounds. Insane. So um, anyway, sorry. Yeah, as far as will I buy Portillo's? No, probably not. Um, one of my favorite things, by the way, at Portillo's, Portillo's, whatever, was their strawberry shortcake. Strawberry shortcake came in this giant container. It was about that thick and it was full of strawberries, shortcake and whipped cream. Oh my gosh, that is ridiculously good. So do me a favor, guys. Someone go to Portillo's or Portillo's and get a strawberry shortcake for me. So, um, yeah. All right. Let's see. 
How do I feel about BMS techs and companies? I have no problem with energy management. I mean, uh, building automation companies or anything like that. I really don't. I mean, no, that's great. I think that um, uh, energy management companies, um, building automation companies, different things like that, I think that it's really important that they understand how the industry works and that they understand how uh, systems work. Like, for instance... I was installing a, a smart internet thermostat controlled system, right, on a restaurant today. And I was trying to explain to the uh, the person that runs the internet dashboard for that particular company. And I was explaining to him like, hey, I need my indoor fans running 24-7. And he goes, well, well, why? And I, well, Actually, I didn't have that conversation today, but I've had it with another one in the past. But I've said, you know, I need my indoor fan running 24-7 when the building's occupied. And then I have to plead with them to help them to understand building balance and how we pull minimum outside air in through our ACs and our makeup air unit. So I feel like energy management technicians or uh, building automation technicians or building automation companies in general need to understand how a building has to work and they need to... Yeah, I think it's best if they have service technician in their blood first and then go into the energy management or building automation system but or controls techs or whatever. Um, but yeah, hopefully I didn't butcher your question there and I answered it somewhat decent. So, all right. Um, you like Chick-fil-A. Yeah, I liked Chick-fil-A too. Uh, the chicken nuggets with the honey barbecue sauce was like my favorite, but yeah, I don't do that anymore either. So is Copeland better than Hiley? I don't know what Hiley is. Copeland is definitely a good compressor company though. They're my favorite out there. Um, all right. I think I'm running out of questions, gentlemen. Um, I am going to wrap this up. I really, really appreciate you guys all coming in here. Please, please, please send me emails down to hvacrvideos at gmail.com. Wow, guys, we hit 270 viewers tonight. I think that's an all-time high that I know of. That's crazy. That's freaking crazy that you guys actually come on here just to listen to me babble. Wow. Yeah, anything that I didn't answer, guys, send me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com. I'd really appreciate it. Um, what's the cheapest manometer for air balance? The cheapest manometer that I would ever buy is a field piece manometer. And then if you're going to do true air balance, you're going to want to go up past the field piece ones. But the cheapest one I'm going to buy is the field piece SDMN six, I believe. Um, any experience with Copeland X line quiet condensing unit, Randy Laz? No, I don't. I've, I've always been curious about the Copeland X line. I do have to say they're packing a lot of crap into that tiny little package. That's one thing that worries me about the Copeland X lines, but other than that, no personal experience. Um, appreciate you guys all coming in here. I'm going to go ahead and cue up the outro music. And uh, please, please, please send me an email if you got any questions that I didn't answer. And let me turn this off and transition this over. And I will catch you guys on the next one, okay? Okay.